Hey everyone, my name is Jeffrey Mew. I'm a product manager here at Microsoft, and I'm working on the Python data science and AI team in VS Code. And by the end of the talk, I hope that everyone can see how you can accomplish your own data science tasks faster and more efficiently in VS Code. This is the last session before lunch, so I'm extra thankful for everyone to come. And um, I know this is, uh, I hopefully everyone's like actually a true VS Code supporter, because I know you're coming and uh, taking your time of your lunch to come watch this talk. So today I'll be going through a typical data science uh, project in VS Code. I'll be walking you through step by step throughout the project from the getting started to the data pre-processing and cleaning to the model selection and training as well, and finally to the deployment of the models. And alongside, I'll be showcasing all of the data science features VS Code has to offer to speed up your development, um, things like VS Code Notebooks, Data Wrangler, which is a completely brand new project, and GitHub Code Spaces and more. And hopefully by the end of the 30 minutes, you'll see how VS Code revolutionizes the way you do data science. Uh, if you've used Python or VS Code before, much of what you'll see today will actually be features or processes you haven't seen before. It'll be brand new, really cool, um, cutting edge stuff. So a quick little bit about myself um, before we get started. I've been on the Python team at VS Code for around three years now. Uh, I also love dogs, as you see on the screen, cats, and Python. Um, the language, I'm still unsure about the snake, so we'll see. <laughs> but again, you can find my contact info on the screen. And if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to come reach out to me at the Microsoft booth um, that we have downstairs. So let's start with a quick demo of what we're actually gonna be building today. Um, everyone's probably heard of like the big, great resignation that's happening right now in the world, and especially prominent in the tech industry that most of us are, most of us are in right now. So because of this, I want to analyze some salary data um, along with the skill sets and background from the Python industry to see if I can develop some sort of model, a crude model to predict what your salary should be given your te technical skill set and background with the hopes that it helps determine your personal net worth and value in the industry. So let's just go over to my uh, where is, yeah, let's go over to my favorite editor, VS Code, and um, I just have like a simple notebook, I'm in VS Code notebooks right now, and I have some simple IPy widgets that just created a form to make it a little bit more interactive, just to showcase uh, um, this power, but let's just do for the first prediction, let's just pick a full stack developer, um, I pick someone that has a bachelor's degree, um, typical someone that works with some SQL databases, they know Azure and AWS, someone that works with React, um, and Docker, and Git. And I'll just put three years of coding experience. And then let me just run the prediction and you can see what we get. And we can see that at least this model is predicting that their annual salary should be around 123,000 US dollars. So I'll go over the data set of what we use in a bit, but I just want to caveat that this data set is from over 80,000 different tech salaries around the world. So it's a statistically significant um, data set size. But now that we saw a sneak peek of what we're actually gonna be building today, uh, let's get started with the actual building of this from scratch. Um, so let me just jump back. Let's pull it here, whoops. Okay, let me just move this so it's easier. So today we're gonna be walking through the typical data science workflow to build our salary prediction model, and each step I'm gonna be showing you how VS Code improves the way that you typically do it. So at a high level, I like to break it down into three different phases, three different steps. The first phase is the data exploration phase, and this includes things like um, finding the appropriate data set, getting the data into data stores, doing data cleaning and pre-processing, such that it can be fed into models, and doing any data uh, exploratory analysis, so looking for trends or patterns within your data. Um, the second phase consists of model training, so this includes things like building the training script, figuring out which models you need to use, uh, figuring out the compute, because most likely you don't want to be running it on your local machine, and then just doing some tuning on the parameters as well. And then finally, the last phase I like to call it as productionization, where you're actually just be saving um, your packages, um, save packaging up your model, having it deployed to the cloud, and creating any APIs so that you can call your inferencing service um, from your application. And by inferencing here, I'm just talking about the uh, model prediction. And the way this diagram is actually laid out doesn't necessarily show how much time is spent on each step. So in the latest survey from Anaconda, um, they found that the majority of data scientists' time is actually spent during the first phase of this data exploration part, um, specifically around data cleaning and data preprocessing and data preparation. And you can see on the screen, it takes up around over 50% of the working hours on average. So it's definitely not proportional to um, what you actually have to do. Like this one phase uh, in the beginning takes up over 50% of your time. And this kind of correlates to the majority of data scientists saying that it's the least enjoyable part of the job because of how mundane and tedious this task is. So I'm just gonna be showing um, some of the features that we have in VS Code that could, should productively speed up your time on this such slow, um, less enjoyable areas of data science. Cool, so let's start off with the data exploration phase. 
So to start off, we'll be using the latest Stack Overflow data. Uh, it's a survey that asked a bunch of questions like what languages you work with, what frameworks, et cetera, uh, as well as things about um, your job information, so what role you work for, your salary, and that's how we're going to be, that's the data we're going to be using to create this model. So a lot of relevant data um, that we can extract, uh, there's a lot of relevant data that we can extract features from, and like I mentioned, this, uh, this data set has been shared publicly with the, uh, with the community, so you can see the link up here. Um, and there's over 80,000 responses as well. Cool, so that's enough slides for now. Uh, let's move on to the live demo, which will be the majority of this talk. So um, before we get started with any coding, of course, you'll need to have VS Code downloaded. So if you don't have it, you can just go to code.visualstudio.com um, and download it for your computer. It's, again, completely free, open source, and cross-platform if you haven't tried it. But once you actually have VS Code downloaded, you'll need to go to the Extensions tab. So this is what VS Code looks like in the Mac. But um, if you go to the Extensions tab, which is this kind of like four cubes right here, and if you just search for the keyword Python, and that should be the first one from Microsoft, and installing it should get, uh, will get you all the Python Jupyter Notebook related functionality for VS Code, and that's where all the data science features that I'll be showcasing today reside as well. Cool, so let's just go back to the top of our notebook. Um, so, We'll be using three super common Python data science library packages for your project that you can install via Anaconda or PIP. Um, we're gonna be using Pandas and NumPy for data ingestion, and data cleaning, and data preprocessing, as well as sklearn for model training and inferencing. And once we actually have everything installed and get up, we can actually get started. Um, so to get started, I have my Jupyter Notebook here, and I'll walk through step-by-step step of what I've actually done. And although I might be stepping through the code a little bit quickly, because it is a 30-minute talk, um, the focus here is mostly around the tooling and the productivity it provides. So if you want to actually look at the code itself, just feel free to pause and rewatch this uh, recorded talk anytime to look at the code in more detail. But again, one of the first things you'll need to do with any data science project will be to import your data set, right? So you can see here uh, in the second cell, and hopefully it's pretty good sized, but um, let me know if I need to zoom in. But um, you can see the first thing you'll want to do is do a pandas, uh, so it'll do pd.read. And you can see as I'm typing, so read CSV, um, Intel, uh, VS Code gives you intelligent suggestions and auto-completions in the cell. So it gives me things like, oh, it suggested what I'm trying to do, so you can, you can kind of tell I'm trying to do read CSV, so I can just uh, tab that as well. It gives me some doc strings about how I can actually use read CSV um, as well as some examples. And then I have the, I'm gonna use the stack overflow survey data set, and again, it understands that this, is, this file is in my um, explorer, so I can, it gives me that auto-suggestion. And then to run the cell, I can either click this run button here or I can just use a Jupyter hotkey shift enter. And again, now that we've created this new variable df, um, there's oftentimes you're actually gonna be having hundreds of different variables in your notebook. And it's kind of hard to keep track of them, right? So although notebooks are great for flexibility, where you can run cells out of order multiple times, one of the biggest annoyances with data scientists is being able to keep track of the state of all these variables, right? So we made that easier by building in a built-in variable explorer within, data, uh, within the notebook editor. So if you just click on this icon at the top right, which brings up the bottom tab, and you click on Jupyter Variables, you'll now see uh, essentially all your active variables within your notebook and your, your running kernel. And you can also see the most up-to-date values. So you can see here I have this DF that I just created. It gives me information like what the type is, um, the size, so you saw it's over 80,000. Um, I have a bunch of other uh, variables on here because I've ran this notebook just for the sake of this demo, but you can see how um, it's really easy to keep track of alphabetized and just super easy to keep track of all, everything that's happening with your notebook. Um, so now that we've actually imported our data into our notebook, we'll want to look at the data itself. And again, the, probably the most, a, most common API that every data scientist uses is uh, df.head. So once I run the df.head, we can kind of see like a snippet of our data. It says there's actually five, um, 50 columns, but if I scroll across, um, whoops, if I scroll across, you can see there's definitely not 50 that's being shown here. And this is because by default, Jupyter always truncates large data sets. Um, so if you want to see the entire data set, we can go to Google, try to search on Stack Overflow, like what code we need to do to write um, to show the entire data set. But you can see this view is always gonna be pretty limited because it has to fit within a notebook cell output. And this is where Data Wrangler, um, VS Code's Data Wrangler, can come in and help. So today I'm excited to show you like a really sneak peek of a project that we've been working on. Uh, I'm trying to scroll for some reason. Yep. Yeah, so, sorry, it's, I'm trying to show, uh, today I'm really excited to show a sneak peek of a new project we've been working on on the VS Code team called Data Wrangler. And it hasn't been released to the public yet, so I think this might be actually be the, one of the first public audiences to see it. Um, but in a nutshell, Data Wrangler is a free code-centric data cleaning, data preprocessing tool that can interact, that you can interact with in an Excel-like interface, but its bread and butter is automatically generating the underlying Python code automatically in the background as you perform your data operations. 
Um, but again, rather than giving like a whole marketing spiel of what it is, let's just go ahead and actually use it. So again, when you're working with VS Code Notebooks um, and you do any outputs to data frame, you'll now see a launch data wrangler button that you see here above the table. When you click on it, it'll take you to a new tab where you can perform all of your data cleaning and preparation tasks. And the cool part is this is a sandbox environment. So here you can explore and manipulate the data with your heart's content without ever having to worry about messing up your original data set. So this is just the everything sandbox here. When you first launch it, you'll see a grid view of your entire data set rather than a truncated view that you just saw earlier. So it gives you um, way, way more information. You can see every single column here. Um, you can also see the summary statistics, which is super nice. So if you see on the uh, left-hand side here, it gives you information about which columns have missing values. So it makes it really easy to tell if the Stack Overflow or whatever data set you're working with um, needs to be cleaned. And if so, which areas of the data that I actually need to look at and clean. So again, going back to the problem at hand, we see the data set has a ton of information, like 50 plus columns. And we have to sift through to figure out the relevant data for, to feed to our model. Um, but we'll start off with something simple, such as filtering for Python developers only. So again, uh, I've looked at this data set, uh, obviously, so I do know some of the key um, columns we're gonna be looking at. So you can see here, language I've worked with. We're gonna wanna filter for the keyword Python, so I can just right click, click filter, and then I'm gonna wanna, let me just pull this down, but I'm gonna wanna search for anything that contains the keyword Python because you can see a lot of the data is aggregated right here. And you can see um, as I do an operation, not only do I get a preview of what's actually happening to the data grid, so you can see um, hopefully the contrast kind of shows, but the rows that are being removed are highlighted in red. But also at the bottom, you can see Data Wrangler automatically generates the code that is required to do that operation. So it instills really trust in the tool rather than having a black box and just doing it in the background. It tells you exactly what's actually happening. So again, if I, um, if I like what I see here, I can just click accept. The other thing that uh, typical data scientists have to do is you have to filter between your data, right? So again, like I mentioned, there's around 50 plus columns, um, but we can easily choose which columns we wanna keep. You see there's a lot of data. A lot of it's really interesting and relevant that might help us, but things that might not be useful, like if they have a Stack Overflow account or if they have like how often they check out Stack Overflow, stuff like that. So we can just do interactive like we would interact with Excel, just doing like a control click. And if I wanted to remove them, I can just do a simple drop column, click accept, and you can see it get a preview of what's actually happening and they're all now removed. One really other cool feature I want to show is if we look at the comp, uh, there's the last column, there's a column called converted comp yearly. And we can see this is um, the actual data that we want to get because this is the annual salary. But we can see there's a lot of missing values in here. So one thing we can do is to actually remove these missing values, right, as uh, many data scientists do. So to do so, we can easily, again, right click on the column, click drop missing values in column. Again, gives me a preview of what's actually being removed. I can click accept, and again, you can see all the code that's automatically generated for me uh, within Data Wrangler. The other thing I'll need to do is I need to convert this, year, uh, this comp column from this currency string format to some sort of integer so I can actually do some numeric operations on it and actually such that our model can understand it because it's not going to really understand strings, so we want to convert it to something that our model can understand. Um, so to do so, normally I would need to write some custom code. Maybe I need to go write some regex to extract it out. Um, many of you are probably cringing at the word regex right now because every data scientist dreads it. But um, we can actually leverage a built-in transformation within Data Wrangler called Flash Fill to do so. So if I just right click and click Flash Fill, um, Flash Fill is an operation that's built into Data Wrangler that uses an AI model in the back end to understand what information you're trying to derive from the original source column, just based on a single example. So um, you can see here, let's just say I want to extract out the actual um, 50, like the actual currency value, so I'll just type in 51,552. And then you can see that just based on a single example, this AI model is able to infer the rest of the values for the new column. And the other great thing is you can see it perfectly did it, and it also it gives me the exact code, and we try to make the code as human readable as possible. So we, don't, we try to use as many built-in Python um, libraries. We don't really, you, you can see there's no other additional imports we need, but the code is super clear in the super clear definition with um, a really nice doc string as well. So it tells you it's extremely clear and reproducible for the users. So again, this looks good to me, so I can just click, click, click accept. And now I have this brand new column, and again, I just did this in a few seconds, but if I had to do this with regex and Googling, this might take like maybe five, 10 plus minutes to do. Um, the last part I just want to quickly show is, let's say um, this is still, you can see it's an object type, so basically it's the string type right now, but like I mentioned earlier, we want to convert it to something that is uh, understandable, so let's move it, let's just convert it, let's just say to a float 64, and then I can click accept. So now we can see it's in a float, um, it's a float value. 
The other really interesting thing is after converting it, uh, we can see there's Data Wrangler also has built-in visualizations. So this is automatically generated. Again, I didn't write any code to do this. But you'll notice there's a lot of outliers in this histogram. Uh, a lot of the data is concentrated at the very left of it. So we can actually zoom in on this histogram just by dragging and dropping. And we can see a lot of the, a lot of the data is uh, below a 500K salary. So the, sal so the salary points here, they range from, let's say, like zero or something to like over 10 million. So we're gonna want to remove a lot of this, these outliers, as we call them in the industry. And again, we can just do so by, um, if we look at the uh, summary statistics, again, we can see, let's see, the, the minimum value is 48. So I, don't, I think that's also a noise as well, because most likely someone's not making $48 um, annually <laughs> as, a data, um, as a software engineer. So again, we can just do a filter operation again, um, and then filter for things in that range. So let's just um, hide this real quick, drag this down, and let's say we want to filter for um, just arbitrarily things that are um, data points that are greater than $10,000 a year. And then let's also add something else. Uh, let's say a max of, um, let me just do this. Let's say a max of 500,000. So we want to do less than 500,000. And you can see as I'm typing all of this out, the code is automatically being generated for me, the previous up being updated live, so you can see this row is highlighted red because it's 500,000 or over. And again, once everything looks good to me, I can click accept, and now my data is filtered. And if I look back at the visualization now, data looks a lot more clean, right? There's a lot less outliers. If I want to remove these outliers, I can set the filter to be even lower, but um, yeah. So um, the last part I just wanted to quickly show is a lot of the data is aggregated into um, one specific column. So if I want to look at what packages people work with, you can see um, a lot of the data is, right, especially here, it's all aggregated into one column. So normally I, can, I would need to split out this column, I would need to encode it for my model to understand, but I can actually just leverage Data Wrangler's built-in uh, multi-label text binderizer, just doing a right click, specifying a delimiter of a semicolon, and you can see Data Wrangler automatically figures out, hey, what are all the categories in here based on this delimiter separation? And you can see it creates new columns for each of them. So there's one for .NET Core, .NET Framework, Apache Spark, et cetera, and sets a value of one to encode if this respondent actually uses it. So again, I can quickly click Accept. So again, I'll, I'll skip the rest of the data cleaning operations just for the sake of time, but I wanted to point out that when you are done, you can just quickly click this button, export code back to notebook and exit, and all the code you literally just wrote is automatically generated or thrown back into your notebook, and you can just rerun it as normal, and again, we didn't actually do any modifications to the original data unless you actually run this code yourself so you can see, uh, hopefully you can see how much time this saves during the most time-consuming process of the data science workflow. So let's just jump back to the slides and just quickly summarize. Um, so Data Wrangler, again, code-centric data cleaning preparation tool that was built in directly to notebooks, so I didn't have to use any separate tools, had smart suggestions, quick insights of um, some summary statistics of like what I need to do with my data set, a bunch of built-in data transformations that just only touched the tip of the iceberg, and a bunch of built-in data visualizations. So you saw with like the histogram as well. So because we're working with um, now that we've been actually cleaned and encoded our data, we can go ahead to the second phase of training, which is around, uh, which is training. So because we're working with a continuous data set of salary data, we, wanna, we can easily leverage SKLearn's existing library of linear models rather than writing your models from scratch. So here's just a simple graphic of how you can actually choose which models write for your, your given problem space. But just specifically for this problem, I chose ridge regression because um, for the salary, uh, for the salary prediction case, we're working with the regression problem, but with under 100,000 um, data points, but there's potentially a lot of different features that we can determine someone's salary, so you can see if I just follow that flowchart, I end up on ridge regression. But let's just jump back to the notebook again to quickly see the actual code for this. Uh, so let me just jump back um, to the model training section. So you can see here, again, um, I'll need to first split my data into test and training sets. I'm just using the train test split function from sklearn. It makes it super simple, um, saves me from writing a lot of code, and you can see I'm allocating 20% of my test data for training, and the rest will be uh, used for testing. Sorry, 20% for training, testing, the rest will be used for training. The input for my model will be a bunch of features that I've cleaned and pre-processed that I've already done with Data Wrangler ahead of time, um, just for the sake of this demo. Um, things like you saw in the beginning of the presentation, like your batch ground education level, what ML packages or what um, web packages you're using. So you can see that's my X value, and my Y is just converted comp yearly, because that's what we're actually going to be predicting upon. And then here I'm just defining the model, and then the fit functions doing the actual training. 
So um, because I'm just using a simple tabular data set, there's no images or anything, and it's not too complex of a data set, the training is pretty quick to run, so I'm able to run on my local machine. But if I was doing something with like a convolutional neural net, or with like millions of images, my laptop would definitely be too slow. So this is where the remote SSH feature can come in and save the day. And if you want to leverage more like compute power for your training job or just have your training job run in the cloud, you can make it super easy to connect to remote servers using a remote SSH. And all you need to do is just download this uh, remote SSH extension, again, from the marketplace. So if you just search remote, um, you'll see remote SSH there. And once you actually have that downloaded, you can simply just go into the, uh, you'll see this green button at the bottom left. And here you can click connect to host, and then you can just type in your host IP of that server, and then basically VS Code's backend will be run on that server, but the front end will remain the same. So hopefully the main thing you'll notice as the end user is that all your training, everything runs just snappier because it's running on that um, backend as well. But the front end is exactly the same. Um, so once I'm actually done with the training, you can see I've got an accuracy of around 87%, which is pretty solid, um, again, just for this simple trivial example. But once I'm done with the training and I'm happy with the code and I want to share the code with others or even use Git to deploy the code, uh, what's great is VS Code has native Git integration with full support for notebooks. So if I just go into the source control tab, if I want to just do a quick, like, see what changes I made to like, this, um, this notebook I made, what's really great is VS Code puts it into a really nice UI. So rather than viewing it as like a crude JSON diff, if you had to do this within a terminal, um, VS Code understands like, hey, what did I change in the actual input cell via code? What did I change in the metadata? What did I change in the outputs? And organizes that, all that for you. So it makes it super easy to just do a git diff if you need to as well. The other amazing thing about git integration I want to show is that the entire data, experience, data science experience that you just saw um, can be done with GitHub code spaces. So GitHub code spaces is essentially VS Code built into GitHub. But how you access it is if you have a um, GitHub repository, like you said here, you see this code icon. If I do click this drop down, you'll see this now new code spaces button. And then I can click that, and it launches something like this, where you can see it's the exact same interface, exact same features, my same notebook, same data set, everything. But now I'm running in the browser. So I don't actually need to have VS Code <laughs> downloaded to do everything you just saw today. Cool. So that was kind of like the training phase in a nutshell. Uh, the last step is kind of to just to productionize the model. So once we're actually happy with the model, we can actually, uh, let me just jump back to the code, but once we're actually happy with the model, all we'll need to do, again, I just made this super simple for the sake of time, but we'll just need to serialize it with the, the pickle package such that uh, I can save it in my local directory and then I can just use this to uh, upload and deploy it to the cloud. And once my model is actually saved, then we can use um, like online services or cloud services like Azure to deploy to the cloud. And what's great is VS Code has built in direct integrations with these. So these Azure services, so things like Azure Machine Learning, if you want to run experiments, or Azure Functions, if you want to host an endpoint, but it's all directly um, integrated within VS Code, again, just through the extensions tab. And again, I don't want to get, uh, I won't get into the details for this talk, but I'll just quickly showcase some of the things you can do with the Azure Machine Learning extension. So you can see here, um, you can deploy your models out here, and what's great is um, it will automatically keep track of the versioning of your models, so it, all that's done automatically for you. You can, keep, you can create endpoints to actually hit that model um, if you're trying to create an API endpoint as well. And then there's computes and data stores if you want to store your data set here as well. So again, just for the sake of time, I'm just going to skip through this a little bit, but just want to close out quickly. I know we talked a lot about different features in VS Code today, but I just wanted to summarize everything we've done and the easy, into easy takeaways. So I'll take you back to the data science workflow diagram that you saw earlier. Um, we started off with the data exploration, right? And we did that with Data Wrangler, right? All of that was done Data Wrangler. The, um, all the code is automatically generated. You can see how much faster it was. The next step we did was the training steps, and that's where we used VS Code notebooks with uh, Jupyter Notebooks. And that's where we developed the training script, we did the compute, and we can connect to remote SSH as well for remote compute power. And the last part was productionization, where we used um, just uh, different Azure extensions to this uh, for VS Code, so things like Azure Machine Learning, and that's where we were able to do some inferencing, um, we're able to store models of the cloud, um, et cetera. But the main, most important thing, which many of you might not realize, is I did this all inside of VS Code. I didn't need to context switch back and forth between multiple tools or do much setup at all, and this is how VS Code is actually revolutionizing the way you do data science. Um, so what's next? Um, so if you want, if you're interested in building your, uh, if you're interested in trying out your data science workflow with VS Code, you can go to this aka.ms link slash VS Code dash Jupyter, and it'll tell you how you can get started. Um, so like I mentioned as well, um, Data Wrangler has, hasn't actually been officially released to the public yet, so we're still trying to target some sort of beta build potentially this summer, so stay tuned for that. But um, if you want to 
maybe get like a sneak peek or join our mailing list for early insider's access, um, feel free to click this link and just submit, um, just submit your information and you'll be notified of when it's, uh, the official beta is released and you'll be added to our mailing list of beta builds. Cool, so uh, we have a lot more exciting new features in Python data science um, coming in the pipeline, so hopefully I'll be back again soon to share this with you, but thank you so much for your time and uh, thank you. <laughs>